try and find the questions that are associated with the section. We've removed, so there were recommended questions in the, in the lectures because I can't physically go into all your physical textbooks and rip out questions that I don't like. Uh, we've removed the questions I feel are really useless. So every question that's left is recommended. You just need to do the things that make sense based on what you've covered already. Oh shit, yes. Thank you for starting to record, whoever started to record. So, uh, I'll try and hit that at 1.30 every time. Um, so I think I think we have a variety of questions here, so I'm just, before I move on this, Noor asked uh, that he, she has taken general chemistry over a year ago because they switched majors. Um, is it tough to keep up? You know what? General chemistry is a prereq for this course. It's not really all that useful. Um, we we mainly have it as a prerequisite to make sure that you have some familiarity with chemical terminology, but this course doesn't directly build on a lot of the things you cover in Gen Chem. So if your Gen Chem is really hazy, that's probably OK. Yeah. This is like lecture one. It's on a schedule. We're covering these things. Uh, it click the video linky thingies on the syllabus to take you to the videos if you need to catch up. So uh, there's a rough schedule under the syllabus tab. You can see what we're aiming to cover every day. Now we're on schedule. We're kind of doing two and one because I kind of did two separately because I went over concepts and I just I think for a lot of you this stuff is review. Anyway, so I'm going to just take a look at this. So if we're if we're looking at Lewis structures, you generally put the least electronegative atom in the middle. There's a sulfur, and you put everything else around it. Now you need to remember how many. Uh, th this one's tough um, because sulfur is not a second row element. And for the most part, when you've been probably drawn Lewis structures previously, you were dealing mostly with second row elements, carbon, oxygen, so forth, that have eight valence, uh, they can have eight electrons in their um, valence shell. Sulfur's weird. You can have a lot more electrons. So what we're going to do is let's worry more about our oxygens. We got four oxygens. There's many ways we could attach these together. We could attach multiple oxygens to other oxygens. You don't see a lot of oxygen oxygen bonds out there though, so it might be worth trying something else. We also know that generally oxygen likes to have two lone pairs. And we also have two hydrogens. Um, those of you taking inorganic chemistry this semester are going to see things that make me want to cry, where you have way too many atoms around too many other atoms, and it just gets weird, like six, eight atoms around another atom. That's messed up and just wrong, and so we're not going to do that. So we have two hydrogens left. Let's stick them on the end. Attach them to an oxygen. Now, if we just add up all the electrons that everybody should have. Oxygens all have six electrons. Hydrogens have one electron. And sulfur is very flexible in how many electrons it can have. Uh, if you actually count up the total number of valence electrons, it's in the same area as oxygen. We expect it to have six. The problem is it also has d orbitals involved and it's going to actually use some of those d orbitals. So um, if you try and count the, ox the, the electrons on sulfur, it gets very, very complicated. Lewis dot structures don't work too well for trying to determine that. So we're going to kind of figure out the sulfur by default by sorting out everybody else. So if we've drawn them out like this, well, let's pair these guys up and let's pair these guys up. 
And now that leaves us with a bit, and that's OK, so I can redraw. This as. This. I promise you I'm not asking an exam question that isn't second row element for Lewis dot structures because. It's it's not intuitive. Um, that leaves us with two oxygens with the lone pair with sorry with a single electron and these two oxygens each with two lone pair two single electrons. So what actually happens here. Is sulfur has six electrons. Kind of what you count, but it's accessing orbitals through d orbitals, so it's not really using the six electrons you think it's using, so it's kind of cheating. And what it's going to do is it's going to make. A double bond with that oxygen. A double bond with that oxygen. And two single bonds with these two oxygens, and we can redraw that. As putting the electrons together. So if you're drawing Lewis structures. This represents double bond having four electrons between two atoms. Uh, when I ask for a Lewis structure, I'm asking for a Lewis structure. This is a Lewis dot structure, sorry. You're absolutely right, Lauren. Uh, we haven't talked about hybridization yet. I think that's in the next lecture. Um, because I didn't see it in any of my notes. We are going to talk a lot about hybridization. Uh, but do bone up on it. That is a good idea. OK. Um, and then these are so it's got two double bonds and two single bonds. So if we're drawing the Lewis structure of this. We replace the dots by lines. So this is a Lewis dot structure. And this is just a Lewis. You know, there's one midterm, one final. I can tell you with complete confidence I'm not going to ask you to draw a Lewis dot structure. Um, we are going to be, you are going to need to know enough about them because it's kind of the electronic counting when you're trying to keep track of where the hell the electrons are. So if you get confused about uh, why is why is it double bonds not single? So that makes sulfur with eight, not twelve. Yeah. Um, so what we're trying to fix. So on. Um, yeah, we can do that too, Amber. So Fatima, why? So there are twelve electrons there around. Yeah, there are twelve electrons around sulfur. So most second row elements can only ever have eight electrons around them because they only have the S and the 2S and the 2P orbitals available to them. And so there's only two P's and one 2S. And so there's only eight electrons available. Sulfur has D orbitals that can pull in from the third row and it's using those so it can help hold more electrons because we're taking more things involved. Um, I'm really sorry. Yes, generally on your Lewis structures, let's let's do that. Um, maybe at the end of the course I might waive that requirement, but for now I, I'm 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 really really sorry. I just came from teaching a grad class. Nope. I think all the oxygens are happy. This oxygen's got two lone pairs. This oxygen's got two lone pairs. This one's got two lone pairs. This one's got two lone pairs. They're kind of the oxygens making a double bond here. I think everybody's got their two lone pairs now. Unless I'm missing something on this side, which is fully possible. OK. Um, how do we know the hydrogen is actually oxygen and not the sulfur? Um, you can't by the rules. You need to know that sulfur cannot adopt a system make, making bonds to six different atoms at the same thing. It's electrons don't reach that way. Um, 
So Sulfur just geometrically can't adopt that confirmation. But from what you know, you can't know that. So this is kind of an unfair question. So that's why I wouldn't ask it. <laughs> We're mostly, if I'm going to ask you to, I wouldn't also would not ask you what the hybridization of the sulfur atom is there. That is also an unfair question. We're going to stick to second row and halogens for hybridization because they follow the rules nicely. Or if something like sulfur, the third row element is acting like a second row element, but here it is not acting like a second row element. And so this is, um, these are SPD orbitals that it's interacting with. If hybridization is even a thing that exists. OK. So. Um, the only other specific question I think I got in here. Was. Talking about in phase and out of phase molecular orbitals. So, so far no crying. This is good. No crying is very good. OK. Let's talk about an in-phase and out-of-phase molecular orbital. So let's take a look at a P orbital on a carbon atom. This is a P orbital. Technically, I have drawn the P Y orbital because it is in the plane of the page. Cool. I've just drawn. Um, so tetrahedral is not a name of a molecule, it's a shape of a molecule. Um, shapes are going, shapes are important, they just are. I, I don't, I'm probably not gonna ask you what is the geometry of this, or of this thing, but if you can't figure out the geometry, you're completely screwed for everything else. So it is a good idea to know that. So this is a PY orbital. I've drawn the phases, the, uh, the lobe there, now, because of the mathematics of these, one of these lobes is negative and one is positive. These are not charges. I really wish we did not call them negative and positive. I wish we called them like green and blue or. I don't know, um, A and B or something. They are not. They are mathematical expressions of the wave function, but they are not charges and they don't really freaking mean anything. Um, they're absolutely equivalent. The probability of finding an electron in either one of the at any at equivalent points in either one of those lobes. This is a lobe. Of an orbital, this is another lobe. They are one orbital. They are not two orbitals. That is one P orbital with two lobes. And what we're basically saying there is that the nexus point. Right there, there is a 0% chance. Of finding an electron. But everywhere else, there's a chance. I'm going to just shade them and not shade them. I am not going to use the terms negative and positive because we are going to talk about charges being negative and positive. And it's going to get hopelessly confusing and everything seems the same. Um, this is neither in phase nor out of phase. It just is. When orbitals come in phase and out of phase is when you're making bonds. So let's say you've got a carbon atom making a bond to another carbon atom, and it is a single bond. I believe I am sharing my screen. I am sharing my screen. Yeah, OK, maybe you have a different view with the gallery. Um, Parveen, uh, just you might need to drag something or like hide the participants or something. Because if you have the participants, you can see everybody there, but you won't be able to actually see. The screen, which is a pain in the ass. Um, Gary, I see your hand up. I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, leave your hand up because I'll forget you, um, but I'll come back to you in a second once we, we do this whole in phase out of phase thingy. So. If we're doing normally what this looks like, uh, and please forgive me for a moment, we're going to talk about hybridization in a second. I know some of you have seen this before. I know others haven't. Um, and we're going to talk about how. Yeah, so let's say these are both SP3 orbitals. Those of you who know what that is, great. Those of you who don't know what that is, don't worry about it. We're going to get to that. 
Um, and I've drawn them both unshaded. They're both positive. They are in phase with each other. You are going to make a bond because the mathematical operations add together. And so um, the wave function in that place is augmented. But if they are out of phase, No bond for you. Because these are out of phase molecular orbitals. And when two out of phase molecular orbitals, when a positive and a minus try and interact together, they cancel each other out. Because uh, the wave function basically plus minus, it goes to zero. So that's what in phase and out of phase is. So in phase orbitals interact, out of phase orbitals do not interact. But an orbital on its own is neither in phase nor out of phase. It is just is um, that that is what it is. It's got a positive lobe and a negative lobe and they're just there. It's when it's interacted with another orbital that's in phase or out of phase. Uh, yes, this is an antibonding interaction. What I've drawn earlier, and we're going to come to antibonding interactions, but not today. The, the, the challenge I think with the first um, two weeks of lectures are going to be that for some of you, this is freaking terrifyingly boring. And for others of you, it's like you haven't seen this in forever. And I'm really sorry about that. So I'm really sorry about anyone I bore to tears. It gets more interesting. And for those who are absolutely terrified, even after this, please read your textbook. Please either go back to your Gen Chem textbook. Make sure you bone up on these concepts. Um, no, spin quantum is not relevant. It, well, yes, it is, but quantum chemistry makes my head hurt um, because I'm a simple, as we say, knuckle dragging organicer. Like I'm like an ape and drag my knuckles on the ground because I'm stupid. And so we try and avoid getting too much into talking about spin quantum stuff. The main reason is because it, um, spin quantum effects are really interesting when you talk about single electrons, but when we start talking about hundreds of electrons in a, in a molecule, it just becomes meaningless basically you, you can't abstract that and so we we use simpler models that work and we pretend that every electron just pairs up properly and satisfies the poly exclusion principle and we get you know a negative and a, an up and a down electron in the same orbital but yes it matters and if that was just a complete just um like gobbledygook to you don't worry about it because it doesn't matter OK, so if we're trying to talk about maybe like a Lewis structure or something a bit more reasonable, that's not quite as stupid. This is trifluoro acetic acid. It's a great acid. Yeah, sorry, Jillian, Ma math is math. I, I don't make the rules. You just try and use them. OK, so take a moment, try and draw the Lewis structure of that. Lewis dot structure. Dot structure. So we're talking Lewis dot structures. Maybe try this Perrier and Juice stuff. It's, it's really not bad. I'm surprised at how Tasty it is. I should get them to pay me to advertise. Or maybe they should pay me not to advertise and not associate it with this course. Um, I have the cherry and peach version. I also have the lemon and guava at home. I've, I've always I like just I like peach juice. I just like peach. It's a really good reason to live down here. Best peaches. But the uh, lemon and guava is pretty good too. Mango is good, yeah. OK, it's enough time to waste. I'm, I'm sorry, I was talking over when you're trying to focus. So in this, where we're trying to do this, the first thing you need to do when you're trying to put together a Lewis dot structure is figure out what's attached to what. So the way we've drawn that, the way we've written that is telling me the left-hand carbon is attached to three fluorines. 
it is then attached to the right hand carbon, which is attached to two oxygens and there's a hydrogen in there somewhere. So if we do that, carbon, carbon, oxygen, two oxygens, three fluorines, just sketching the atoms first. Uh, and hydrogen's dangling out over here. It's not completely, it is completely clear where the hydrogen is, but it might not be on inspection if you haven't done this before. So let's remember how many electrons every atom has. And if, if you need to get out your handy dandy periodic table. Um, I don't actually have a periodic table. So, but anyways, the halogens like fluorine, row seven, right next to the noble gases, has got seven electrons. Let's just draw in our seven electrons. These ones are easy because they got seven electrons. So it's three lone pairs and a spare. Carbon is the universal bonder. It's got four electrons. Always initially sketch in four single electrons on each part of the corner. We can move them around later. If you know where to put them, great, awesome. If you don't know where to put them, I, I, I have I have internet too. Like I'm okay, nor but still. Um, if you don't know where to put them, um, put them like that, and you can figure stuff out later. Oxygen has got two lone pairs and two single electrons. It's six, right? So carbon's four, oxygen six, fluorine seven, nitrogen would be five, but there is no nitrogen. Hydrogen's one. So we can start, you know, grouping things together and solving problems. So the two all the carbons and fluorines can stick atoms between them because we're grouping sort of single electrons next to each other. We've got these two single electrons between the carbon and that looks like they should be together. We've got two single electrons here between the oxygen. Let's stick those together. And we got that here. So we can, you know what, we've made some bonds. Great. Now we just need to worry about our unpaired electrons because electrons don't like being unpaired. Those are radicals. Radicals are unstable. Uh, they don't last very long except for like really, really special radicals, which we are not going to talk about in this course. No special radicals for us. So we've got one, two, three, four of them. Now, if I attach this hydrogen to the carbon, I'm stuck. There, I'm really proud of myself that I said stuck and not something else. So if I attach the hydrogen to the carbon, I'm stuck because then each of these oxygens is going to have a lone pair or a lone electron, and there's no way for me to attach them together because they're not next to each other. So let's not do that. Let's attach the hydrogen to one of the oxygens. So if I do that, I've got that, and then I have two atoms an oxygen and a carbon, each with a single electron that's unpaired right next to each other. Well, that's easy. I'll just throw them together and make a new bond. So I can get this as the Lewis structure. Sweet. So Akhil asked, um, so Albion shared that the strawberry and kiwi is good. Akhil asked, can we always draw it left to right the way it's written in the formula? Yeah, um, there are going to be a few cases where the way we draw, we write this formula, this, this is called a condensed structural formula, is a little bit more unclear, but in general you can go from left to right, or right to left, I guess, if you're Arabic. Um, that's fine too. Yep. OK, so um, let's translate that into a Lewis structure. And we get that. 
No, it doesn't matter which oxygen it's attached to. Both oxygens are absolutely identical. We can't actually tell the difference between two oxygens. No, it doesn't matter where you put it either, Ali. When we're drawing a Lewis dot structure, it doesn't matter. There's no three dimensionality in a Lewis dot structure. It's kind of a two dimensional map, so it doesn't matter where you arrange things. And in a Lewis line structure I've just drawn there, there's also no three dimensionality. It would not matter where I, I by my nature, twist, uh, drew, put an angle on it because my eyes are burning when I draw it like that, but I will draw it like that because it's OK. Here. OK, so one of the other concepts we were. So I think again for a lot of you, this is review, which is great. Uh, one of the other concepts we touched on was formal charge. So let's say we want to assign the formal charge of. I don't know why I just drew a cross of Lorraine there. And. Uh, asterisk. Just randomly putting symbols in. I guess I could have used letters or numbers. Uh, yes, you're going to be. We, yes, yes, yes. Lone pairs. Thank you. Yep, you need to put the lone pairs in. Absolutely. Um, that's a really shitty asterisk. So if we're going to try and calculate the formal charge on these atoms. Does anyone remember the equation for formal charge? You know what? Sorry, wait, I have I have hands in the air. Um, so uh, Gary, you've been waiting very patiently. Uh, what's your what's your question? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, excellent. So uh, I've entered this course through the syllabus link and I still can't access the chat box. So what was the other option for entering this course like uh, the lecture? Um, I think you can access it through your calendar. But I, sh I think I'm entering it from the course link too, so I don't really understand. I wonder if Teams is not updated on your computer or oh, if you should contact IT. OK, I'll figure that out later, I guess. But are you on, are you on the are you on the desktop? app or are you on like an internet like on a browser uh this is desktop i believe or actually no it opened up then it opened up into the browsers i mean yeah uh, if you're in a browser i don't sure you get the chat i think the the browsers you want to have it you want teams downloaded on your machine okay yeah i'll figure that out later then That'll thank help. you uh and hamza you also have your hand up oh well, oh, I also really like oh you had a question sorry gary yeah I also really like your YouTube videos, so I thought oh. they were really funny. <laughs> oh, OK, I, they're, they're lectures. I don't think they're really that funny, so I'm glad you like them. No, no. <laughs> I have no idea what to say. <laughs> like in a comedic aspect. OK, um, I, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you're not bored. That's yes, I'm, I'm glad you're not bored. I, I think. I, I believe that if I am boring, this stuff is already hard and you guys are all going to tune out and then it just becomes impossible. Mm -hmm. So I promise not to be boring. OK, thank uh, you. As, as not boring as somebody talk about organic chemistry can be most of the time. OK, uh, Hamza, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just had the I had the same question as Gary with the chat box, so I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out later. It's OK. Yeah, I think that da yeah, download. Make sure the app is installed on your computer. If you're using it through the, the web uh, browser, I don't think it works. If you're on mobile, I have no idea. I, um, I, I do have the app. I, I don't know if it's just, um, I don't know, maybe I don't have the updated version, but it's it's the same thing as uh, what Gary said. It, go, it goes straight to the browser when I join the lecture. OK, so maybe join, try and join. Um, I'll try and post like uh, some meeting invite or something online, but I think you might also have it in your Teams calendar. So if you open up Microsoft Teams on your computer, like on the app, it, your calendar should populate with this course. OK, that and I think clicking on that will take you to this meeting. OK, OK, yes. All right, all right, thank you. 
you really shouldn't tell me the comedy helps because it just encourages me because then I think I am funny and no one's funny when they think they're funny. So um, yeah, OK, we, we got an answer while, while we we're doing all that. So a bunch of them uh, calculating formal charge, number of valence electrons minus number of lone pairs, number of electrons in lone pairs minus one half the number of electrons in bonds. So formal charge equals number of valence E. E minus means electrons because it's electron and it's negative and it's small because it, electrons are small. Minus number of E minus in lone pairs. Minus number of E minus. Sorry, one half. number of E minus in bonds. Absolutely. Let's just make sure we're counting the number of electrons and not the number of lone pairs. Um, I'm sure that's what you meant. I'm just being pedantic. Because I'm an academic and that's what we do best. So if we're looking at fluorine, fluorine has seven valence electrons. So this F minus FC formal charge fluorine one. Uh, seven valence electrons minus six electrons in lone pairs minus one half of two electrons in a bond. I punch that into my head and I get zero. If I look at carbon double dagger or single dagger or carbon cross of Lorraine, there we go. Formal charge equals four carbon's valence count is four. Um, now there are zero electrons in lone pairs. And there are eight electrons in bonds. Note that we're counting electrons in the bonds no matter where they came from. We didn't care if they came from carbon, oxygen, fluorine, whatever. The, the electrons are there. They're in a bond. Now they're in the bond. Carbon's got half share of them. But again, punching this into my mental calculator, I get zero. If I go with the carbon cross thingy, Four, again, no electrons in lone pairs. Uh, there are still eight electrons in bonds. One of them is a double bond. Doesn't matter, it's a bond. There are four electrons in those, this double bond thingy. Still equals zero. And if we look at oxygen, asterisk, formal charge, valence of oxygen is six. Minus four electrons in lone pairs. Minus one half of four. That also equals zero. This is a really boring formal charge calculation, so everything is neutral. Cool. Um, if so, uh, Aurora asks, can you write OH and Sarah, do you have to show the connection between O and H? If I'm asking you explicitly to draw a Lewis structure, you have to draw the bond because it's representing the electrons between the O and the H. For 98% of this course, you can write OH. Is the formal charge supposed to be zero for each atom? In this case, yes. We'll do one next where it's not. OK, let's look at. This guy, I say draw me a Lewis dot structure of that dude. The total charge on any polyatomic system is the sum of the formal charges of its constituent atoms. Yes. And the formal charge on any multi-molecular complex, like this one I've just drawn, is the sum of the formal charge of all the individual components. Yeah, that one was easy. That was more about Lewis dots. OK, let's not draw Lewis dots here because Lewis dots are boring. Let's draw Lewis line structures. So again, one thing you do have to be cautious about when you're doing this 
is I drew this as NCH3-4-CL, but you can't connect the chlorine to the other things. They just, it just doesn't work because these are all second row elements. They can only take eight electrons. Everybody's got eight electrons there. I cheated with the hydrogens. I did not draw them as Lewis line structures, but I will forgive you. No, I won't. I'm forgiving myself because Um, yeah, I'm in charge. So if we actually count up the total number of electrons here, we can actually get confused. This is where a Lewis dot structure could do us a little bit of favor. And the reason is, how many electrons are around chlorine in this molecule? How many should be? I'm seeing seven from seven, 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 seven. Do we have any other answers? The sevens are way out in head. Oh, Carolyn in with an eight. She's got an eight. We got some eight with question marks. We got some eight with 12 question marks. We got sevens. We got technically eight. Technically correct is the best type of correct. It's eight. Why is it eight? Because chlorine is a formal is like valence of seven, so there should be seven, but there's not. There's eight. Why are there eight? OK, let's look at the other part of this, and this is where we got ahead of ourselves by not drawing Lewis dot structure, which I might have meant as a lesson, or I might have done just completely by accident because I felt like it. Let's take a look at carbon. Each of the carbons have a single, uh, the other things all tied up with the hydrogens. Don't need to worry about the hydrogens, they take care of themselves. Nitrogen is five. Normally the chlorine would just be seven, so let's just draw sort of our initial starting point. We've got ourselves a problem here. Because great, bond, 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 bond. Oh shit, there's an extra electron. Now, when we say things can only have eight, second row elements can only have eight electrons around them, it's because they only have four orbitals. And we're going to talk about orbital hybridization uh, soon. <laughs> Not sure if it's next class, but the class after. Um, I think we're doing some resonance stuff first because I love resonance. But I really love resonance. But the, the reason is you only have four orbitals. So there's only space for eight electrons in those four orbitals. And those four orbitals can either be holding two electrons in a lone pair, holding a single electron, or making some sort of bond. That's it. Those are the options. There are three things an orbital can be doing. And right now our four orbitals are making single bonds, and we have an extra electron, and there's no room for that electron. So where's the electron go? Oh, God, I'm starting to panic. But there's a chlorine nearby. It's got space for an extra electron. It's going to let me breathe. Phew. Ah, yes, it is. A, this is an ionic pair. I'm going to come back to the ionic bond thing actually in a second, and I do have time, so I'm really happy to. So let's talk about formal charge. Let's calculate some formal charges. The carbons are all going to be, I'm going to give you a hint, the carbons are all going to be zero, they're boring. Let's look at nitrogen, nitrogen formal charge. Okay, what's the valence of nitrogen? Somebody. Fives, great. OK, uh, there are clearly no lone pairs. Minus one half the number of electrons in orbitals. And how many electrons are in orbit are in bonds for that poor nitrogen atom? I heard three. No, there's not three electrons in bonds. Eight, I hear ten. We're all over the place. Five, four, eight, should be 10. Um, nitrogen's only got eight electrons in bonds there. It's got, it's it, single bond with this carbon, so that's one bond. Single bond with that carbon, that's one bond. Single bond with that carbon, that's one bond. Single bond with that carbon, that's one bond. That's four bonds. There are four orbitals. Four bonds is the most number of bonds we can make because we only got four orbitals, so it's eight. 
plus one. Now if we do chlorine, seven minus eight minus one half of zero is minus one. The overall molecule is neutral, sweet. These two pieces though don't make a bond. And so this is where we get to the idea of an ionic bond. I, is there such a thing as an ionic bond? What is a chemical bond? That's a trick question. There's no answer to that question. There's a massive argument. There actually is no definition of a chemical bond by IUPAC because um, we can't decide what we mean by a chemical bond. So normally when we refer to a chemical bond, we're referring to a covalent bond. A covalent bond is two electrons sharing electrons, two atoms sharing electrons more or less evenly. Um, more or less evenly is doing a lot of work there. And again, we can't quite define what more or less evenly is. But two atoms sharing electrons. The electrons are located between the two atoms. The atoms are located close to each other and don't tend to drift apart. That is a covalent bond. An ionic, often they talk about ionic bonds. Ionic, ionic, I prefer the term ionic interaction because normally what it is is you have an ion pair. You have a positive charge and a negative charge and are attracted to each other, but there's no actual bond formed. The electrons are not shared between the two systems. It's more that a cloud of electrons is attracted to a place that has deficient in electrons, but there's no there's no orientation. A bond is oriented. Things are in specific geometries aligned relative to one another, whereas in an ionic interaction, stuff is kind of like balls bouncing into each other. The, the angle that which side of the ball is bouncing in doesn't matter as much. It's just then if this ball is all negative on the surface, this ball is all positive on the surface, it doesn't matter where they interact with. If it's a covalent bond, you are attached to a specific point on that atom. So ionic bonds aren't really bonds, they're more ionic interactions. So this is an ionic interaction where the negatively charged chlorine is attracted to the positively charged tetramethyl ammonium, but there's no actual sharing of electrons. There's just an electrostatic attraction. Would the chlorine be behind the nitrogen then? Uh, the chlorine could be in front of the nitrogen, it could be on top of the nitrogen, it could be in any geometry relative to the nitrogen or all of them and rapidly moving closer and further away and bouncing around. Um, I'm trying to figure out if what Mohammed said was a question or a statement. Uh, so what we would do here is on this. We have to now that we've identified that there are formal charges, we have to draw in the formal charges and we note that. So what we could do if we were having to draw this as a Lewis dot as a Lewis structure. It smells like somebody's smoking here. We would draw it like that. We don't actually indicate there's a bond. Now this can get tricky. This one's easy because there's clearly no bond here because nitrogen's already making four bonds. Uh, nope, formal charge can be plus two, minus two. It can be plus three, minus three. Uh, it can be plus four, minus four. I think the highest I've ever seen is plus seven. I've never seen a minus seven. They start getting bad at that point. You just get some weird metals. If the formal charge of the entire molecule isn't zero, does that mean the structure is incorrect? No, it means that you're, you're incomplete with it. You might have a counter ion that you haven't accounted for. It doesn't mean your structure is necessarily incorrect. I could have said, what is the formal charge of this? These are all CH3s. And you would say, Dr. Trant, that is positive. Everything else is zero. The formal charge of the system is plus one. That doesn't exist in the bottle, but that's not a thing. You can't get like ammonium without a counter ion. It just doesn't exist. But you can look at a single ammonium atom 
if you had like a really, really tiny microscope. Um, some sort of even electron microscopes can't do this, but. If you if you could uh, and you would be able to see that, hey, there, there's a thing here that is plus one, so that is not incorrect. It's just there's something else nearby that's going to be minus one to counteract it. So Noor asked, I am still confused as to why N had an extra electron. I thought N likes to have eight electrons and carbons have eight electrons. Why Cl has eight electrons? I don't know what Cl is. Chlorine, chlorine. Why is chlorine have eight electrons? Well, the nitrogen had five electrons. The problem is it was trying to make four bonds with things that already had one electron. And that math just don't work. Because. If nitrogen is making single bonds with all these, there's going to be nine electrons around a nitrogen and that's one electron too many, so it needs to get rid of an electron. So it eats the electron at the chlorine that's nearby, which only has seven electrons and it can catch it. So basically electron goes from here to there. I'm drawing an arrow there. I, I promised I wouldn't do that yet. Um, so we're going to just basically we delete. Ah, why is Cl? Because then nitrogen, because OK, so why not just draw this? Yeah. OK, nitrogen is the second row element. It has one S orbital and three P orbitals. We're going to talk about hybridization, so it only has four orbitals available to it. That's it. It's like the, it is not possible for it to have more orbitals and each orbital can either make a bond. Hold a lone pair or hold a single unpaired electron. Those are the three options it has. And what we're asking here with nitrogen to do is to have five orbitals involved, but it doesn't have five orbitals. It's like I've got two hands, so if I grab my coffee in one hand and my. Perrier fla flavored Pesce Chagis in the other hand, and somebody now hands me a guava and lemon version of this. I don't have another hand. I might really want the guava and lemon. I'm thirsty. My thirst will be quenched by that. Like I'm a positive. If you didn't get the analogy, it's really heavy handed. I'm a positively charged thing and the guava and lemon thing is negative. Um, I really want it, but I only have two hands. I can't take a third. Nation's got four hands. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like some sort of. Polytheistic goddess. But we, with if it's four hands are holding things, it can't take a fit. It just it doesn't have the hand. Um, uh, Deepashika asks, would it be incorrect to show an arrow for the nation's electron move to chlorine? No, it isn't. But if we're trying to draw a structure, arrows involve movement, and we're not drawing movement here. We're drawing kind of finished states. But in your working and thinking about things, is completely what happens. The electron leaves nitrogen and goes to chlorine. So that is a completely accurate statement as what happens to that poor electron. Um, if nitrogen was sulfur or some other atoms, would it be allowed to make a double bond with one of the CH3s? The sulfur could, but the CH3 couldn't. The CH3 could only make a single bond because it's, it's carbon and it can only make four bonds. But if it was a CH2, sure. That's fine. But if this was if this wasn't nitrogen, if I magically replace that with phosphorus, which is right below nitrogen, that's fine. Uh, I don't think that exists, but there's nothing technically wrong with it that could happen. And those would all be covalent. But it's not nitrogen. It's not phosphorus, it's nitrogen, and this does not exist. 
This is an abomination. Unto chemistry. And it shall be burnt. With flame. OK, so please don't draw second row elements with making five bonds or I'll, you know, I'll get the J's put little devil horns or something on it. I, I don't know. I can figure it out. You'll lose marks, so it, it's not worth the joke. Yes, nitrogen can only use the 2S and 2P orbitals to bond with other atoms. That's true of all second row elements. Um, I don't know, uh, so I got a question from Aurora. What would I like the final answer to look like? I don't know what the question I asked was. Um, <laughs> so if I was asking about the formal charges, it's basically going to be like this. If I was asking for the Lewis dot structure, it would be that. Uh, with not necessarily the circles, just the dots. If I was asking for the Lewis structure, it would be that. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly meaningful on this page. Uh, there's nothing actually on here is right. Yeah. Exactly, Mohammed. Second row elements, most four bonds. Organic chemistry, say UG. It, yeah, it's, it's that simple. Like that, that's all we can do. Four bond. We're going to say four things where a thing can be a bond, a lone pair, or a single unpaired electron, which we'll desperately be trying to make a bond. Okay, Amber wants a midterm date. Um, I propose. So what I what I was sketching around on here was I, I'm really sorry about this. But I know that no matter what date I choose during the week. It's going to spill into the lab and somebody's going to miss their lab, and so that sucks, so we can't do that. Um, so I hate doing this to you people because you seem like very nice people. As far as I can tell. Maybe you're all assholes. But. I propose either Saturday the 16th or Saturday the 23rd. I'm, I'm really sorry, Abby. As a. Um, as a date to do that. The other option is that we could do an evening exam. Um, because I know we have evening labs. Uh, that would be uh, October, about midway through. Yeah. OK, won't do the 16th because that's reading week. Fair, 23rd. Please not 23rd. You know what? There's 300 of you. Um, because we only have an hour for class time and I can't do a midterm in an hour. Yeah, I know you like the 16th, but I think somebody pointed out that I'm actually not allowed doing that. Uh, how about 1 p.m.? I think we'll do the 23rd. I will. So if you I, I'll, I'll send out a formal announcement because here I'm talking, it's not in writing. Um, if you can't, and I'll say this in the announcement, if you can't do the 23rd, the reasons that are acceptable is uh, I know Seventh Day Adventists cannot do anything on a Saturday. That's fine. Uh, we would have to reschedule it for Sunday for Seventh Day Adventists. And then uh, if you have something else going on, we could retry and reschedule that for the Sunday. So there might be a makeup exam on the 24th. Uh, I'm going to guess like 1 to 4 because um, 1 p.m. isn't too early. 4 p.m. is not like and at 4 p.m. then you can just go out drinking. I mean, or responsibly celebrating with a peach and cherry. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll do the 23rd. It's October. There's not a mid. There's only one midterm. Um, I've gone back and forth on this. I, I in person I would give two midterms. Remotely, I'm going to give one midterm. You got enough stuff going on. And the idea with the two midterms is it reduces the stress on any one midterm, but then you really just feel the full stress anyways. Uh, and you're no further ahead. There, there's no good answer to any of this. It's October. 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 The 23rd is 10 days from now. There would not be much of a midterm. Yes. It is three hours. It will cover whatever we get to. 
I'll put a line under something and say here, this is where we're done. Normally about a week before. Yeah, no, no, I am. I will I will be writing about this. This is this is an unofficial discussion we are officially having through writing, but I haven't written it down in here and other people aren't going to see it, so it has to go up by email. Otherwise, it's not real official and I'll update the syllabus to put that in as well. OK. We're at 2.30. I'm pretty much done with formal charge. Uh, next class, I guess. I was overly ambitious in trying to get through some of this because I think this is new for some people. So I, next class, I expect to be talking about polarity and electronegativity and maybe talking a bit about resonance to get ahead. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see where we're at. So I would bone up on your polarity, electronegativity and take a look at the resonance stuff. And I will see you guys on Wednesday. Have fun. Bye. Stop recording. I can't because Mohammed is recording. <laughs>